to my channel. Hey yo, hey yo, listen up, listen up, yeah. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. The wireless woman. You in charge of the girls, right? I am in charge of the girls. Are you in charge of the girls? I am in charge of the girls. Okay. All right, Y Fives, welcome back to yet another transmission of the wireless woman. Do me a favor on your way in and like the video. Why? Because when you like it, well, I love it. And if you haven't already, go ahead and make sure you subscribe to the channel. And click the notification bell for notifications of when I upload new content and when I go live. I'm really, really, really excited about the fact that before I move next year, I have some wonderful guests that are going to be coming on to the show. Hopefully, we will be having some very multifaceted conversations that will present different perspectives. The Wireless Woman is not about me getting out here and proving points and being right. It's about me finding out if I am right about certain things. And part of that is conversations that need to be had. I come from a family where we have conversations <laughs> where you get, you know, different generations giving you their perspective on things. And I'm starting to find, especially those of us who are in that millennial generation, that first generation who had video games and cell phones and all that stuff, parents, families broke down, stopped talking to each other. And you know, unfortunately, a lot of even just the art of conversation, the art of being able to sit down and listen to another person, you know, we gave that type of respect to our elders. And now millennials, that we are becoming the elders, ah, we can't listen to nobody. We can't talk about nothing. We're still Toys R Us kids. I don't want to go. And this channel is not about that. It's about continuing the discussions, um, continuing the traditions of having respect for wisdom. And so I'm going to be bringing some folks in who don't agree with me to give you their perspective on things so that we can find truth as a collective consciousness instead of being out here in error without any accountability or correction. And yes, the black woman is still God over here. The black woman is the first manifestation of God on earth. <laughs> but he created them. Male and female created he them and he blessed them and he gave them dominion. There's a certain amount of authority and dominion that we are not going to be able to operate in a certain amount of balance and peace that we can't find as long as we are in disharmony with each other. And ultimately, <laughs> peace is my goal. Now, I'm not one of them Martin Luther King peace fighters. Oh, no, 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 baby. Peace might come by any means necessary. By any means necessary. But peace all the same, once it is attained, is only exercised by everyone having the same rights and responsibilities that we as women have. So in the light of being much more cosmopolitan, I am going to have a lot more guests on, a lot more male guests. I've got some female guests slated as well. We're going to talk about finances, health and wellness. PTSD and mental health. We we got a lot to talk about. So you need to click that bell so that you can be here when we do. But in the meantime, today we are going to be talking about the double-edged sword. The Bible says that 
the tongue is a two-edged or double-edged sword. And I think it's interesting that the word sword has the word word in it and how we really don't take time to think about it. But in this era, this day and time, we're watching words really be weaponized. It's really the weapon of choice. You know, whether people are hurling them at each other across social media platforms or typing it in the comments, these words, they're pretty reckless. They've gotten out of hand. And it's out of the overflow, the abundance of the heart that the mouth is speaking. So this is a very clear indication that something deep is wrong. Something deep bad is wrong. And we got to get to the bottom of it. I got enemies, got a lot of enemies, got a lot of people trying to drain me of my energy. So as I said, I ain't even going to hold you. I got on this mic way too late tonight <laughs> to have a whole lot to say. But I started thinking back over the history of gaslighting, over the culture of narcissism that we should have seen coming down the mountain as she comes, that we should have seen coming from the 90s. <laughs> I was looking at movies like Boomerang, Love Jones, <laughs> you know, the movies that we love to watch, but that really spoke to a certain dynamic between Black men and Black women before we ever even got here. A lot of us think social media, and I believe it has, has exasperated the gender issues in the black community but um yeah we, we've been doing struggle love we've been doing um cheating and you know it's pretty much at the center <laughs> of all of our love songs love should have brought you you homeless you should have been with me you know we've we've been doing this doing this for a while now. And what I started to notice is that I've never met a trash man that didn't have a group of trash friends around them. You know, we're consistently being told that we should choose better black men. But even men aren't choosing good men. You know, a few good men would be great. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Um, I'm noticing that we're being gaslit by these men because they know that we're dealing with trash men. I was watching... Like I said, some of these struggle love movies from the 90s. Um, the 90s was such a weird time because it was so beautiful and romantic and fun and toxic and bitter and angry. Like it was all that. I, I don't know. I guess because we didn't have the world wide web. We didn't have social media to be able to compare our stories of being all down. All we really had was, you know, um, love and basketball. You know, we, we had this stuff, but we weren't really putting all of those pieces together. But a lot of these men, you know, like the wood and the best man, they were covering for each other. You know, we talk a lot of, we talk about a lot of caping. There's a lot of caping that goes on in our community when it comes to men and black women, unfortunately, just don't receive that same type of protection, that same benefit of the doubt, um, that when in doubt, you know, a black woman is probably doing something uh, good, not bad. We don't, we don't have that. And I know a lot of men will say, oh, that's not true. Oh, oh. But like I said, we can look back over our experience you know, um, you cannot negate a person's lived experience. I love the little scene that opens up Cynthia G's channel because it's the white woman saying it. She's like, I am a white woman <laughs> who grew up in a white community. I'm telling you, 
that it's not a badge of honor. Like you, you're refuting the person about whom you form the opinion when they are giving you their lived experience. So I can't give you the lived experience of a man. I know that men want me to be male identified and cape for them and pull out a nice red matador cape and cape for them. But I can't do that because I myself am not a man. Neither can I give the perspective of a man because a lot of men lie to and manipulate women. Other men know this about men. I know that because the men that I know will tell you not to trust men. Because they know they're a part of the baller player matrix. They're a part of it. So they know. <laughs> they know the game and how it goes. You know the game and how it goes. We try to get chose. So a lot of times we as women don't fully know that part of the game because they run that interference for each other. The game doesn't really work if we know it, if we find out about it. And it's weird because the white man has been running the same game for decades. You would think we would know by now and have it figured out. But because we don't live behind the lines of white privilege, there are a lot of things that we get worked over about because we just really don't know. Like once I went into the finance world and I started to see how people with money spend money. Maybe I was like, these are the things they do not tell us. These are the rooms we are not allowed to go in. And when we do go into these rooms, we are held to the standard of white supremacy. You have to conform in order to be in these rooms. You have to comply. Okay, maybe you can't hold on to your blackness inside white supremacy. It is a requirement of your induction into white supremacy. And a lot of black people um, have been inducted into white supremacy. And so it causes us to identify with our oppressor, you know, like Stockholm syndrome and say stuff like, well, you know, I don't feel like baby. Behind them white enemy lines, it's, it's something different. And it's the same thing for male identified women. You got to speak. Speech is a very cult minded thing. I'm going to be doing a video talking about <laughs> the resurgence, <laughs> the rebirth of slick, the return of the Mac, how pimp culture from the 70s, just like bell bottoms, is being recycled back into the black community and what that means for black women. And all bitches are the same, just like my hoes, you know. I keep them broke. The hoes and, and the tricks of the pimp story. But we as women are going to have to get sober-minded about that because when you look back over a lot of these relationships, like I said, we're 40 now. So we're old enough to remember how things were in the 80s, the 90s how things were in the early 2000s, in the 2010s. I mean, we've been around a long time now. We have made it all the way to the 2020s, and we're acting like we're still not hip to the game. So the two-edged sword is the fact that you have men on their worst behavior. I mean, Drake style. I'm on my worst behavior. And then they have other men who come in on the other side and gaslight you into feeling like what you know to be the truth is unfair to the men who are already in male privilege. See, look how shy he is. So can I get your phone number so you can call me sometime? Then you got the extra layer of women coming in like the end game of Avengers and gaslighting you as a woman into being like, well, he's a good man. Do we beat you? Do we, do we cheat on you that you know of? A woman in general and a black woman in particular does not stand a chance 
against a tide of men who are on one side doing injury to women. And then their counterparts on the other side who say, well, it ain't no fun. If the homies can't have none, ain't no Sing that shit. The homies can't. I can't hear you. there is this solidarity in men that says if some of them are getting away with a certain thing, then even though I may not necessarily agree with it, by at least not allowing those people to be condemned, if I do want to come into the league of supremacy then there will be room for me. I see the same thing be applied to capitalism where people are getting so rich off of keeping other people poor. But when you talk to other poor people about banding together against the rich, they don't see the rich as a villain. They see the rich as people they aspire to be. They're like, well, Jay-Z came from nothing and he became a millionaire. So if I do what he does, I too will be a millionaire instead of understanding that Jay-Z walked to million billionaire status on the backs of his community, that he crushed and broke a lot of people to get to that place. And what I've noticed is that in the pursuit of that wealth, people grow cold to the plight of their fellow man, that the common becomes detestable to them. And the Bible talks about how a poor man is hated by his neighbor. And I'm seeing that same correlation because you have to understand these systems work the same no matter what it is, whether it's capitalism whether it's racism, whether it's misogyny, you can put these systems on autopilot and they work. Because somewhere, someone identifies with the power structure. They feel powerful when they watch certain people get over on other people, crush other people. And so I see women complaining about their relationships with men and the plight of men. And then you'll see in the comment section, all these men coming out of all these portals to save men from women. Men, the same perpetuators of violence, of sexual assault, of neglect and abuse. From the abused, it's like the great gaslight. So you got this double-edged sword here and women are getting their head cut off on both sides because no matter which way you come from, if you tell the truth, if you share your lived experience, you are going to be hit with capes all in your face. <laughs> they throw you in the coat room and just cover you with reasons and excuses why you're wrong to expect a person who's supposed to protect and provide to do that. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Everyone always asks me when I talk about what the issues and the problems are, what is the solution, right? So here's the solution. The solution, Black women, is to know knowledge is power. When I got behind those lines in that financial space and I started to learn all the things they don't tell us I became responsible at that point to do something different to make a change and you know I'm buying my homestead my own little property for myself in South Carolina and I've already started to turn my sights towards buying more investment properties towards really setting myself up over the next 20 years because I didn't do what I should have done with my first 20 years. You know, you're not responsible for anything before you turn about 21. So from 21 to 41, yeah, I've been playing with my money and therefore playing with my time. Okay. I have had people playing in my face. And now that I'm learned now that I've had not just some knowledge, but some experience behind that, 
I'm able to make the most out of the opportunities that I have. And I never could have done that before. So now we got to take the knowledge that we have. We can't be 40 year old fools, 40 year, acting like 40 year old virgins. Like how weird are we? We see them coming to defend each other. So therefore they don't need our help. We as black women have been mewling for the world. We have been the one who the blame and responsibility and burden of everyone has been laid on. Go and watch those movies like Mudbound, The Help, The Color Purple. These are not <laughs> fictional stories. These are the lived experiences of our matriarchs that have been passed down to us you know like I said when I went back and started watching some of them 90s films I was like well I forget we been been treated like trash we been been competing with each other for men they've been been acting like the prize since pimp days really well I respect your ambition Willie but you got to have vision Black men have always been a commodity in the black community. They have always been such a scarce resource that we have been willing to compete to the death for them, that we have regarded them as precious as, you know, and no other group of men is treated like that. I know we're being told that these women in these other communities treat black men like that. They treat black men like that as a competition to black women because we're the only women who treat men like that. So clearly, if you're going to take a man out of our community, you got to be ready to be his mother. You got to be ready to be a worshiper. Because you just don't see that same type of emphasis be placed on the style, the swag, the desirability of men of other races do you know who is the most upwardly mobile group of males in the u.s right now even more than white men and i gotta do a whole video around that for you black women who think that white men are the salvation of the black woman because a lot of them are poor as well the same issues that we see with the master race the master class of whites in this country is being mirrored by the behavior of black men. I mean, it is literally the yin and the yang, but in the middle of <laughs> chaos energy and resurrection energy is a group of brown men. I mean, they don't consider themselves to be black. They think they're white too, but Asian. Asian men are the most upwardly mobile group of men. They out earn white men in the middle class by an astonishing amount of money. And when I say Asian, I know people automatically assume I'm talking about Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, and I am, but I'm talking about them in addition to Indians, red dot, not feather. A lot of them making real bankroll, real money. We got a lot of people here from Pakistan, from Middle Eastern countries, they have actual money. Okay. And no one talks about how desirable they are, how much swag they have, how luxurious and dark and moisturized their hair is. No one talks about the way they smell. No one talks about their physique. No one talks about <laughs> any of that. Not when it comes to Asian men or the next upwardly mobile group of men, which are Hispanic men. I mean, some of y'all been thirst trapping on them. Let's not. You know, let's not be disingenuous here. But for the most part, when we talk about the men that get the people going, um, that's the reason why. And I, and I find it funny, too, because whenever you talk to black men about dating outside your race, that's the first thing they say. 
Now, when you are dating a Pookie and a Ray Ray, they'll tell you you should have chose better and that all of the baby mamas are with the same trash men. And that's the reason why we're having the same experience, because we pass over the lames and we pass over the good guys and we pass over the successful guys. But when you go to another race of men, whether they be Asian, white, Hispanic, the first thing that a black man want to throw in your face is the fact that those men aren't as sexy, aren't as attractive, aren't as desired as black men. Didn't you just say we need to choose better? Didn't you just say we need to do better? Didn't you say we should get lame dudes? We should get dudes that men pass over? But then you're going to sit here and say how undesirable men of other races are in comparison to black men? What's the what's the difference? If a woman chooses a good, lame black man versus a good, lame white man, if the point is that we should choose better. You see my point, ladies? It's the gaslighting. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. Bamboozled. Let us stray. Run them up. Okay, it's the confusion for me. <laughs> it's the you can't win. You can't win. You can't win. And when you can't win, for the people who always ask me, what is the solution? When you can't win, you don't play. No, we don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> we always think that everything's so black and white that it's win or lose, that it's good or bad, it's right or wrong, it's, but there's a third option. We don't have to play this game. We don't have to continue. There's life outside of desirability politics. I talk a lot about going off the grid when it comes to energy dependence. When it comes to having our own natural food sources, growing our own food, I talk about going off the grid when it comes to getting off of social media apps. You cannot be inundated with those type of messages of your worthlessness on a regular basis and still be emotionally, psychologically, mentally healthy. You know, our brain has a biochemistry to it. it. It creates these pathways for information to go down. And you don't want to turn your brain into mush with negative thoughts because it is impossible in some ways to darken the pathways that we use the most. You can see it on EKGs, I think that's what they call them, where they'll look at your brain, or is it an EEG? I think it's an EEG. I know my son had to have one. And they put all the little stickers on top of your head, and they measure all your little brain waves and your electrical activity in the brain. The brain lights up. There's more electricity in the brain than in the city, in the city of Atlanta, okay? If you could use the power inside of the brain if we could harness it you know a lot of people don't know but a lot of the model that things we see are built on is built on models of the brain highways all types of things have taught we have learned how to engineer and orchestrate these things by the physical traits of the brain so you can see these electrical signals traveling down these little ridges in the brain, these little pathways. And once one has been carved down in your brain, every time you get that same stimulus, it'll travel down the same pathway. It's the path of least resistance. That's why they talk about trauma and trauma responses. It doesn't even have to be the same thing. If it reminds you of that experience, it's automatically going to go down that pathway. So I'm saying that because we are out here taking hits, being sliced up with word swords for what? We're dealing with hurt people who are out to hurt people. I mean, samurais, okay, deadly with a sword for what? Till one of us dies? I mean, if he dies, he dies. Like, I say that because I talk 
in my Sigma female video about being both this, the shield. I talk about being both the shield and the sword. And I'm going to tell you something, baby. I'm deadly with a sword. Ask my baby daddy. I will use some words to end your mother's life. Okay. And when I think about all the words I've used, for what? What did it gain for me? What did it build? What did it prove to another person about my value? It's time for us to actually be quiet. It's time for us to retreat. It's time for us to lay our weapons down. But I don't want Black women to be defenseless. I don't want us to be rolled over as we have been in previous generations. I want us to be protected. But that protection, a lot of times, is not entering the fray. It's not entering the fight. It's not being in this war of words because they talk about it being a gender war. But ain't nobody throwing titties around. Like, ain't nobody throwing penis around. We're throwing around words. We're out here to really harm each other. I mean, harm each other in an irrevocable way. If these words could feel, baby, it'd be. I would have several homicides myself. I'd be America's most wanted myself, just being real. Because women, we speak 200 more words a day than most men do. We, if it come down to the words, baby, we, we got them. We got them. They're physically stronger than us. They can't do nothing with these words. They're trying. They're trying their best to compete with us. And we're empowering them to continue the fight with us because as soon as they say something, baby, we right back on it. Your mama and your mama. We're reactive. And it's difficult to be revolutionary to really change a system as long as they can keep you bogged down in it and reacting to it. I'm just asking you to put the energy in another place. I'm just asking you to really look at how we got here. There's no way forward. We're at the dead end of everything we can do to each other verbally. And I'm not asking you like <laughs> Black Panther style to put your weapons down. I'm just asking you to save the fight for who really hurt you. Save the fight for the system we need to build instead of the one that we're trying to dismantle. That really is a man's work. And I promise you, there's a lot of men that are getting pissed at their own image being destroyed. And if it don't, I mean, if it don't matter enough to them for them to take on each other and really begin to say to each other, like, listen, um, what Charlemagne the guy say, black men don't cheat. So they got to call each other in accountability. They got to call white men into accountability for elevating the black woman above them. That's, that don't have nothing to do with us. That's, that's, they coming to each other man to man. <laughs> I mean, we coming to each other woman to woman. It sounded like a Betty Wright song, the way men and women are talking to each other. We got to let them have this. That's my solution for women. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of men that would love to hear me be the one to say that because I am so vocal. They would love to hear me out here silencing the women of the world. But not today. Said, but y'all know I believe in being unbothered to be unleashed. Not to be <laughs> unbothered so you can get ran over and, and treat it like, a, <laughs> uh, like 12 years a slave. I'm going to share a story. And, you know, part of my healing journey I'm coming to find is if you see something, say something. Um, truth is the one thing that all narcissists hate. They hate to have people expose them. So I'm going to share a story from my own personal experience. Ain't negate experience. Opinions, yeah. Facts even sometimes can be refuted, but not experience. This is what it is. But in my second marriage, and you'll hear me talk about my second marriage a lot. My first marriage, hardly ever. We were kids. 
I married a stone cold psychopath. He don't have no feelings about it. And now, after many years, neither do I. But my second marriage was different. Because I was older. I thought I had defeated the ghost of my past, and I hadn't. And like I said, my ex-husband has vowed on a blood oath that I can never talk about him. But part of me taking my power back is acknowledging what was done to me and that my experience is the truth. Like I said, you can let these people gaslight you, baby. And they'll get a whole group of, if they're narcissists, they'll get a whole group of flying monkeys that was around them, <laughs> that will surround them with the power of He-Man uh, and, and not let you get at these people, okay? Um, these people have gangs, Googles, gaggles of friends that believe the best about them. And you can never speak on their image unless you want to fight. Sometimes a physical fight. I mean, people will go that far to protect these people. You saw what Donald Trump managed to get everybody to do to keep him in office. And if he, he just didn't have enough time. If he had had enough time to organize that thing, he was so certain he was going to get the next four years that he didn't really put the energy into it. But if he had organized that thing like he could have, baby, we'd have a totalitarian government right now. <laughs> <laughs> we have the United States of Trump, baby. It'd be Nazis, Nazi Germany, Hitler, Stalin, Lenin. He's about to do it, okay? He's about to do it. But I digress. In my second marriage, my ex-husband got to where he wasn't coming home. He had great reasons for why he wasn't coming home. You know, he had to be there for his mom and his daughter and all these other people that were outside of our home that we were building together. And, you know, the first night I came to him, I said, hey, I'm at home. You got to be at home. What do you expect from me? I can't be here with you and your kids and my daughter's in the street. Okay. I said, I understand. I do. And I think there's a way we can resolve it. I think there's a way we can solve it. But when it comes to being at home at night, we come home at night. There were certain standards, boundaries, and expectations I had set for my marriage up front. And it's difficult to negotiate with a narcissist because their goal is chaos. Their goal is to be, they have an antisocial personality, so their goal is to be um, defiant. Oppositionally defiant, that's what they call it, I think. Um, so it don't matter what you say. It's not going to be that. But I, there had been infidelity in his previous marriage. And I had already said, if I got reason to think, believe, hope, dream, the possibility that there could be that, I am out. A narcissist is going to always find the pen and pull it. They're going to always find the mine, the landmine, the IED, and step on it. They're going to find that line and push and push and push the boundary of it. And this had been going on for years. So I already knew that we were at the tipping point. So the first night he didn't come home till the next morning, we had our discussion. I said, listen, that can't happen. Maybe a week or two went by. And this time he stayed out the whole night, went to work the next day. I didn't see him till the next night when he got home. Like the last time he was out all night, came home that morning, took a shower, went to work. This time he stayed out all night, the whole morning, the whole next day until late that evening. He got home about 11 o'clock after having left the house at like four or five o'clock the day before. Like a smooth 28 hours. But when I got up that morning, because most nights I would get to bed and he wouldn't be there when I went to sleep, but he'd be there when I woke up. So then the second time I woke up in the bed by myself that morning, I called my job. I said, hey, I ain't going to be able to make it in today, y'all. You know, we got a family emergency. I'll be in tomorrow. I don't know what day it was. Maybe a Tuesday, maybe a Monday. I don't know. I know it was a weekday because I was supposed to be at work 
that day. And I called him, said I ain't going to make it. I went in the closet, and I started to pack up his things. He had a duffel bag. I had a duffel bag. And then there was another, like, travel bag that I had that I didn't mind parting with. And I spent the whole day and most of the night, because I told you he didn't get back till like, 11 o'clock. I, I, te- I didn't speak to him till over in the afternoon. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to drive Uber after I get off, and I'll see you around by 11 o'clock. I said, okay. I spent the rest of the evening packing up everything, everything. Everything was folded up. I put all the undershirts together with the socks and put all the underwear in one bag. You know, I put short sleeve shirts together with shorts and long pants together with long sleeves. I made sure he had his toothbrush, toothpaste. There was a little brush he used to clean his fingernails out with. He got that out the shower, made sure he had his shower gloves. I mean, I was meticulous with it. Everything that that was like everything that went together was tucked in the little pockets together. Like even for weeks after he left and we split up, he would call me and be like, oh, I left so and so at the house. And I'd be like, no, it's in the gray bag on the inside pocket. You know, I put this on the outside pocket. But if you open it up in the inside pocket, because you, you hadn't unpacked everything yet, it's down in there. Like, I mean, baby, he was packed for the gods. He was packed like he was never coming home again. He was packed. Like Richie Vento. Yeah, Barbara, it's Richie. Yeah, look it, I ain't never coming home no more. Take it easy. Ladies, that's the type of composure you got to have. When he finally did come home that night at 11, all the stuff was packed. It was at the door. And he cried <laughs> when he came through the door. I cried too. We cried together. Like an OJ song, we cried for hours. And then around about one o'clock in the morning, I so said, I think it's time for you to go. Because, you know, wherever he was going, I didn't want him going into their house in the middle of the night because I wouldn't have liked that type of disrespect in my house. People ask me, what is the solution? That is the solution. To let go unplugged, unbothered. And unleashed is not just a slogan. It's not just a motto. It is my way of life. I have had to pack and unpack. And this is metaphorical because you see me leaving my hometown. And I love my hometown. And I would never want to leave. I could never even imagine an instance where I would need to. Charlotte has had everything that I have needed to grow and be the woman that I wanted to be. But now it isn't. Now it isn't that. And now it's time to go. You have to know when you're not wanted, when you're not needed in a place, and you have to be able to catch and release. You have to believe enough in yourself and in your value to know that it translates. Just like life, just like people that you love in life, energy is never destroyed. It's only transferred. You know, people leave, leave here and we believe they go to heaven and then they go to hell. Ladies, you got value. You got worth outside of validation for men. And I want you to find that. I want you to find your happy place. I want you to drop that fire headphones emoji in the comments. And until the next episode, you listening? leaders what is our concept one band one sound one band one sound